what we're looking at. The big picture is we found in, in chapter six of Revelation, the rider on the white horse is huge. It's not just a little blip. This is God introducing us to the final phase of human history. This rider on the white horse is an influence, which John the apostle calls the spirit of the Antichrist, who becomes a person, embodiment of the devil called the Antichrist or the beast. And he is the worst human who ever lives. He's a real person. He is someone that Satan has always wanted to have allowed by God to be in power. I, I've shared this uh, many times. I believe Satan has had an antichrist. Uh, I, I think Nimrod back at the Tower of Babel was, was an antichrist with a small a. Someone that was really doing Satan's bidding. But God has always suppressed those who Satan has wanted to conquer the world. See, the Antichrist is a person who finally does what all humans have wanted. He unites all humans across all ethnic, racial, uh, language, religious barriers, socioeconomic. He finally unites the whole world. And there's one, as it were, king of the world, of humans. And he's a human. And he's the worst human who ever lives. And we bump into him right here in chapter 7. Well, the, the lesson that we learn from the scriptures is that this man, we first bumped into him in Revelation 6 and 13. He's the false peacemaking rider on the white horse. Or as you see, oh, let me get once more because that doesn't show me what you're seeing. Uh, he's called the beast in chapter 13. He's the rider on the white horse. Next, we see him in uh, the, the long sermon Jesus gives in Matthew 24 that we spent a long time there. He's the one standing <clears throat> in the holy place that brings in what Jesus calls the abomination that causes desolation. I'll explain more of that as we get further in. Then we saw him in Paul's long description. In, when we went all the way through and tracked through 2 Thessalonians 2, he is called by different names, the man of sin, the lawless one. And finally, the title that all of us know, he is called the Antichrist. Now, it's fascinating. This title that is so popular by prophetic books, you know, the Left Behind books and Hal Lindsey books, you've all heard of the Antichrist, but he's really not mentioned that often by that name. He has 30 other names. Uh, he's big in the Bible, but the Antichrist, Christ, uh, who is uh, described by John. Well, now in chapter 7, as you look at the prophet Daniel, we see the longest. Now, this is the longest description of this man. This is the most vivid. Now, we're only going to cover one chapter of them, but there, there are many elements that we're going to see in here. And you say, even as I'm going through this, you say, well, why would we even want to know this much about him? I mean, uh, let's talk about Christ. Why would we talk about the Antichrist? Because in this chapter, we find, in chapter 7, we find the perfect reminder from God. As we're going to read, starting in verse 7, in just a moment, we're going to read them. But in Daniel 7, 7, what you find is this horrific, beastly man coming. And all of a sudden, the camera swoops and focuses in on the throne of God. Then the camera goes back in divine scriptures on this horrific beast. Then the camera goes back on Jesus Christ as the King of kings and Lord of lords descending. Then the camera goes back on how awful the beast is, but then it goes back on God conquering. See, what the Lord wants us to do is to realize that horrible things are going to go on on this planet to the very end. And there's going to be the worst time yet ahead that earth's ever known. But the whole time, those horrible tribulation hours are upon the earth, God is still on that throne. We're going to read about in verses 9 and 10. And Jesus Christ is coming back to right all wrongs. So chapter 7, verses 7 through 14. Let's stand together with Daniel open, and let's hear God's voice through Daniel the prophet recorded in the Holy Scriptures, and let's invite God to speak truth into our lives through his word, by his spirit. Chapter 7, verse 7. And after this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, 
exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Verse 9. I watched till thrones were put in place. And the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The court was seated, and the books were opened. Verse 11, I watched then because the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Verse 13, I was watching in the night visions and behold one like the son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. There are 27 chapters of the Bible and counting, and this morning we need to pause and think about how many different chapters God used to describe this evil servant of Satan. Why does God go to the extent that he goes to tell us about this man coming? Well, in in the bulletin you can see tonight, uh, you know, the, the morning service sure does trigger a lot of interesting questions. And, and someone uh, last week as I was leaving, they, they said, wait a minute. And they're all written. They said, wait a minute. If we're talking so much about the tribulation, are we going to be there? Uh, and, and how do we know we're not going to be there? And by the way, can anybody that's alive right now be saved during the tribulation? I mean, these are wonderful questions that, that we're going to have fun with tonight. But John talks about, uh, I mean, Jesus talks about this, this beast coming in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. That's three chapters. And then Paul describes him in 2 Thessalonians 1 and 2. That's two chapters. John describes him. That's where the Antichrist passage comes in in 1 John 2 and 4 and 2 John 1. Then Revelation actually devotes from chapter 6 through 20 is all about he rises, the Antichrist does, in chapter 6, and he's finally placed in the lake of fire in chapter 20. And between those two, there are 15 incredible chapters. And now, right now in Daniel, we see him in Daniel 7, Uh, We're going to see him in chapter 8, we're going to see him in chapter 9, we're going to see him in chapter 11, and that's four more chapters. So the worst human who has ever lived already is the subject of 27 chapters of the Bible. Now that's extensive coverage. Did you know anything that gets 27 chapters of coverage is on the top of the fold? It's big to the Lord. It's vital. So this worst of all human beings has extensive coverages. And I want you to think with me about a man that has so many different names in the Bible. Why does God call him that man of sin and lawless one? Why is he why does he describe him as a beast that is ferocious and horrific? And why is he called the son of perdition? Well, it's for this reason Satan empowers What we're seeing in this man is what the devil can do if God doesn't restrain him. This is a normal human being that becomes a completely surrendered to the devil's control vessel. Now, that should ring a bell because God doesn't allow Satan to do that very often. He allows him to temporarily do that from time to time, but he never 
pulls the rods out, you know, control rods, you know, nuclear reactors, the, I forget which one now is leaking somewhere in America, you know, we have another nuclear reactor problem flashed across the news. But what they do is they put those rods in to absorb the neutrons to, to slow the reaction down so that there's not too much power being produced by the atomic reaction inside that reactor. Well, God does the same. He restrains the devil. He puts the rods in of his restraint and doesn't let Satan do all he could do. But with the Antichrist, the Lord pulls out and says, you can have unfettered display of malignity through this man. Life. That's why the Antichrist is such an example to us. This guy's normal human being that totally is surrendered to the devil. And he ends up running the whole world. Something Hitler couldn't do, something Stalin couldn't do, something Genghis Khan couldn't do, Alexander couldn't do. Nobody has done it. This average Joe of a guy with the power of Satan harnesses all humans under his domain. Can you imagine what an unfettered life can do? Yeah, you can. We know him. Guys like D.L. Moody, guys like the Wesley brothers, guys like George Whitfield, guys like Martin Luther. Those are incredible. And, and the incredible, not so known people that aren't named by missionary biographies that have allowed God to do exceeding and abundantly through them. Well, this man is empowered and he's the worst human ever of all who have ever hated good of those who have ever hated god of those who have hated christians the antichrist will be the pinnacle and when this man appears he pulsates with the power of demons remember the ones that the demons could break the shackles this guy is going to pulsate he's going to flow with the great powers of satan so much that even people's money they're buying and selling even their lives will be at his nod and his snap of a finger he is going to be immensely powerful okay daniel chapter 7 let's go through this chapter i call this the pedigree and and you can start in verse 8 with me and notice these words okay daniel 7 8 this is the pedigree of the worst human who ever lives in the book of daniel we have many descriptive titles for this person known in the new testament as the antichrist and here's just a summary of these titles first of all he is the little horn, if you see in verse 8, which makes him the greatest power broker politician of all time. One man does what all other kings have tried to do and failed. One man unites the world. Nimrod failed at Babel. Alexander fell at Babylon. The Caesars failed to conquer the pagans. Genghis Khan couldn't take Europe. Hitler miscalculated Britain and America, but the beast subdues the whole world. It says it later on in this text and also says it in Revelation 13 that he has the whole world as one big kingdom that he rules. Secondly, in verse eight, he has the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking pompous words. This horn has eyes and a mouth and it's the most brilliant communicator. The world is vexed by the Palestinian issue and Jerusalem and the Arab-Israeli conflict and radical Islam and on and on, but this one man can talk the world into going his way. He seems to win at first just by communicating. And, and the power of communication is very effective with him. In verse 21, he is the ultimate hater of God's people. It says in verse 21, he makes war on the saints and prevails. Now in the book of Daniel, remember the church is, is a mystery that wasn't before revealed in the Old Testament. In the book of Daniel, the saints are the Jewish people. They're the followers of the Most High. They're the ones that have the temple. They're the ones that have the prophets. They're the ones that have the sacrifices. And Daniel is referring to the Jewish people. And so in the tribulation time, the saints are the believers among the Jewish people and those that they, remember they're the evangelists, Revelation 7 and 14 say that 144,000 Jews, ethnic Jews, evangelize. They become the ultimate. You know, we have the crows that go to Ethiopia and many other missionary families. God has his own set during the tribulation. He actually has three sets. He has the two witnesses, he has 144,000, and he has the angel. God has three different 
mechanisms for sharing the gospel. But this ultimate hater of God's people is the greatest persecutor. Others have tried and failed to extinguish God's people, but God allows the evilest of men to prevail, to martyr, to hound the saints of God, and to almost exterminate believers on the earth. In fact, the martyred saints of the tribulation show up in Revelation 6 and 7, and they're coming up martyrs out of the tribulation. And when John sees them in Revelation 6, he says, what is this countless, innumerable number of people wearing white robes? And the angel said, those are the martyrs that God is allowing the beast to kill. So this, is, this man is the greatest persecutor of all time. He's also the most fearsome warrior. Verse 23 says that he devours the whole earth. He is the greatest and most fearsome warrior. No one else has been able to conquer at all, but he does. His conquests devour, those are God's words, the whole earth. The last, the biggest, the greatest empire and emperor is the one yet to come. With technology, with God granting him authority and Satan's energizing, he is like a ravenous beast of a man. He conquers humans on the earth. In fact, if you look at verse 23, it says he tramples and breaks everybody in pieces. It's like nobody can stand before him. Militarily, communication, persecution-wise. And finally, this is fascinating, uh, he twists history and morality and religion. He's the greatest atheist of all times. In fact, there's a little indication, a hint. This man not only goes against every law of God and every hint of righteousness and every reflection of the Creator, but in Daniel 11:37. Many, many, many Bible commentators and Hebrew scholars believe that Daniel 11 says that this man is a homosexual. It says he doesn't regard desire for women. That's kind of a tame way of saying homosexuality. So this greatest of atheists hates God, hates the creator, hates any rule, hates any law, hates any custom that God has set forth, and the ultimate being that he revokes what God says his desire is for male and for female. And he is the greatest atheist of all. 